Well, good evening to friends. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome you to the... Uh, thank you, Your Honour. But still, I'm very glad to welcome you to the second lecture of this year's Open Lecture Series, uh, organised by faculty of Architecture of Estonian Academy of Arts. Uh, and the lecture series is supported by Cultural Endowment of Estonia. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Cristina Diaz Moreno and Efen Garcia Grinda. Oh. Um, Cristina and Efen studied architecture in Spain, Polytechnical University of Madrid. They are co directors and co founders of Amit 09, which is an experimental architectural practice based in Madrid. They started their office in 1997. Um, they are currently visiting professors or at the uh, Institute for Kunst and und Architektur, Akademie der Bildenden Künste in Vienna, Diploma Unit Masters at the AA School in London since 2009, and visiting critics at SOA Princeton University since 2017. And they are directors of Option Studio in Harvard uh, Graduate uh, School of Design since 2015. Quite amazing collection of school, I have to say. Um, their work is part of the permanent collection of the Pompidou Center in Paris and has been exhibited uh, in the Venice Architecture Biennale in the official section in 2010, 2004 and 2000 in the Spanish Pavilion in 2014 and 2002, and in the Greek Pavilion in 2014. Their projects have been widely disseminated and they have won more than 40 prizes in national and international competitions. Just recently their work has been published in the prominent architecture magazine El Croqui. Amit 09 cultivates a post-digital after pop approach to the contemporary notion of space and at least sociology, technology, media, politics, and representation in projects ranging from architecture to design, ecosystemic studies, and hybrid urban project. Please join me welcoming Christina and Efren and Emit Serenai. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you for inviting us and, and for being here listening to us. We are going to start, I'm going to start telling you something that is going to stay here. You cannot explain this to any other one. We came here for the first time in 2001 to the other part of the, the other part of the water, to Helsinki. We won uh, European in that year, we won the prize, the prize, and we were supposed to come to Tallinn to receive our prize. And we were so young, so young, that we didn't have experience traveling. Now we travel a lot. And my passport was expired. So I was there in Helsinki, like, I cannot go. And I thought, no, we will go very soon. That is like 18 years ago. But happily, <laughs> this is the end of the trip. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> so, well, the lecture today, yeah. It's called being a gardener is to build experience, and well, a, a friend will explain a bit later. Uh, he will elaborate on this, but it's going to be um, a, a lecture also about time, time and the distortions of time, like this experience with Tallinn, and how architecture can be super long or or can be like very fast. Uh, as part of the work in the office. And um, we always try to start explaining how we understand architecture and how we work with um, like our world around. We are always looking at our world around and mixing things. And, and we are always trying to, to consciously uh, understand the complexity of the world around to, to, to use it for our, even our own practice. And also when we are teaching to students, we work in this way. So it's our way of um, working, I would say. And 
¿ya? Sobre. Es que no. Jumping, ¿no? So, um, we are going to visit several gardens along the lecture. We are going to talk about gardens, about strange gardens. And uh, we always uh, explain also our projects as this kind of amalgam of things that are coming from the very different origins that sometimes they are not making sense apparently, but at the end they are constructing a, a work of body, a body of work. And we are going to talk about birds, people, about cosmologies, we are going to talk about uh, vision, strabismic, and also third natures. And we will end up talking about Amit, that is the name of the office, that is the space in between. That is a very important understanding and concept for us. <coughs> so obviously, uh, the, uh, for those who know a little bit of um, history of gardening, the title comes from a uh, someone that was the founder of the principle of the um, uh, seven, uh, uh, 17th, I was about to say, 18th uh, century landscape gardens in in UK, <coughs> William Kent. Uh, it was an apocryphal kind of a statement that many people have attributed to him. That is to be to be a gardener or to be an architect. Uh, means to construct experience. And basically what he did uh, in continuation of the work of, by John Bambrook, that was uh, his master at that time, and who initiated most of the gardens that William Kent, Kent ended to construct, was based on this kind of, uh, in landscape like this one, like the, the lake at, at a Stove House, or in Chiswick House in London, that were usually called Elysian fields in reference you know, to, to the paradise. Uh, they were initiating basically a totally new and unknown treatment of nature, combined, uh, that was going one hand with hand and combined with an architecture based on associations. And that's pretty important. So a kind of connotation that are not coming from the language of architecture but are based on the connections that the perceiver is making throughout time with things that are coming from history. But also throughout the experience of these gardens in communal walks, so the English gardens, remember that they were meant to be perceived while walking and discussing with others. But more, <coughs> most importantly, they were, for them were representing ideal places of multiple ideological connections and that's pretty important it's not that well known that were somehow the places that represented a somehow the the the, the, the rediscovery of uh, making politics uh, through opposing totalitarianism and absolutism basically led by the Whig party that were the liberal party that at that time in, in the UK so these walls of politically engaged, uh, constructed experiences are fundamental, as you probably would notice along the lecture today in our work. But let us explain why somehow we decided long ago to incorporate those connections with history. And that for, hope, that for those who, who uh, know us, it's kind of strange to talk about history somehow. Uh, but uh, let's try to, to, to talk about it, you know, how we were incorporating and why we were incorporating these ideas into our practice. So after this short introduction, very compressed introduction about very important topics for us, uh, we are going to talk about just one project. So today we are going to talk about this project coming in and out and, and showing things that were happening at the same time when we were doing the project is uh, called uh, Institución Libre de Enseñanza that could be translated something like Free Institution for Education. And uh, well, we won a competition 10 years in 2004. And uh, the, the project, as many projects, was done during 10 years, 12 years. And at the same time, uh, in our office, were happening many, many things. Um, as I said, uh, we understand, we use the complexity of the world around to construct also our own projects not understood as a building or a, an object or an isolated uh, 
piece of thing, whatever, but as a cosmology of many connections with many things uh, in terms of not only location but also time. And uh, is the, this project is uh, very much uh, into it, or we understood this project into it. But let me introduce also very briefly, very shortly, what the Institución Libre de Enseñanza is, because it was set up in 1976, so 19th century, uh, as a constantly evolving uh, experimental laboratory for new teaching methods. That was the idea. And it was driven by a group of pro professors in the Middle East, Ginés de los Ríos, and they were sanctioned by the university, and they were suspended uh, because they were pleading for academic freedom, freedom, that, that is a word. And all of them, they were conven convinced that the way of improving society was teaching to, I mean, children education. It was the, the main idea for them. And then they created an institution that uh, it was very important at that time, but it was fostering the most important cultural and scientific centers of, the, of Spain, of the country in which people like Federico García Lorca, maybe these names are not, in, not well known in here, but in Spain they are extremely well known. Federico García Lorca, Salvador Dalí, Juan Ramón Jiménez, Luis Buñuel, Antonio Machado, and several Nobel Prizes, they were connected with this institution. They were like truly in contact with them. And that was the most brilliant generation before the Civil War. The most brilliant generations in the 16th century. We cannot say the whole story. But but the civil war came and, and they were like laminated, they disappeared, they were, it was a very tragic moment. The historical place uh, was taken uh, by the dictator, by Franco, and he burned the library, the archive, he burned the, the original garden, there was the garden in there, and it was also demolished, and, and many of them just went to exile. In general, all those people under the standards, they were not living in Spain anymore. So our culture was tragically cut and stopped. And only after resuming democracy, uh, these, these supports, they started to come back and to try to recover the, the foundation, the, the try to recover the institution. But at that moment, nothing was left. No, almost no pictures, no information, no archive, no libraries, no, no books. So the only left thing was the memory of a kind of understanding of a, an idea of teaching children, only this kind of like a identity, if you wish, or a kind of a spirit, if you wish, but nothing else. So for us, as an architect, as architects, the target was how, you, how can you reconstruct the idea of the institution without like left remaining things coming from the past, just a way of understanding, and how you can do it through architecture, how you can make decisions through, our, through architecture. So the site, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it can be seen in the interior, that's the building, that is nowadays completely a uh, urban place, you know, when they founded the institution was like in the outskirts of Madrid. Mm. And, and just to like, Elaborating a little more on that because it was very important for us, and not to be, not trying to not be a nostalgic one, uh, repeating something that was uh, like coming from two centuries ago. That that was the mental for us. So Christina explained it very well, but you know these people were known, and the descendants were very well known in Spain as the secular monks. So someone that is a. a Going, going beyond, you know, teaching children and, and trying to live in an imperfect ways, in this case not connected with religion. So someone that is expanding uh, this notion to aesthetics, to space, to the buildings that they constructed, to the garden, the, to, the, to clothing and everything else. So something that somehow could be uh, interesting for us as well in, in terms of how you could deal with them, right? Because they were like dealing constantly with this perfected life through aesthetics. And then allow us, uh, at a certain point when we discovered that, uh, we were somehow in our, in our head thinking about how to re-elaborate on, contem on contemporary notions of a space. Space is a kind of, in architecture and architectural history, is a very well-known term that is mainly connected with modernism. 
but somehow we wanted to, reco to reincorporate the uh, contemporary notion of space into our practice. Let me def define or, or, or somehow state that for us space more than an empty um, a vacuum or, or a place which is uh, just uh, in a space for ex um, uh, experimental aesthetics, it was, and it is, um, um, a complex where, a place where an immense amount of interrelations between different actors happen. So it's a place of interaction, basically. It's the space that we are constructing in here in this room that it, we obviously know that is different whenever we are in here and whatever we are not. And it's constructed by you listening and us speaking with the images. This is a place of interaction, of exchange. And that what we wanted to reincorporate into architecture. Um, let me explain why or how. Um, opposed uh, to a purely passive concept of reception, which is mainly something that in architecture has been the, the mainstream, so to speak, a space was for us a, a place for intermediation. Uh, and a, it's the experience of ourselves being part of a situation under permanent construction. It's basically a changing set of interrelationships between different actors. So if that is the definition, I mean, I don't want to enter too much into uh, somehow theoretical aspects, but if that is the definition, you could perfectly understand that for us it was really important to define who the actors of this set of mutual interactions were. And we, surprisingly, we were like elaborating on that, and we surprisingly found these guys, you know, that this is Henry de los Rios in one of the only few uh, remaining images or photographs of himself. He was refusing to be photographed all his life, right? Um, suddenly, we realized at this point that um, the context, something that we architects are dealing with constantly, you know, the, in, in terms of the physicality of the site, of the physical surroundings of a place, could be, uh, following this understanding of the space, more related or associated with a group of people with a common culture, with a common identity, rather than uh, the physical, uh, usual understanding of context. And this was a, a personal, a small discovery for us. So basically, uh, realizing that we could be uh, understanding design and the practice of architecture looking at people. And I know that you know the, the, this might sound a very populistic thing, right? Like uh, many architects are reclaiming people as the center of the thing. But in this case, it was specifically what we wanted to do. Because architecture, it, it is, as a discipline, has had uh, serious difficulties uh, to identify and to characterize us, humans, as the basis for, for, for the construction of the space, of, the, of environments. Because if you think about the, the usual characterizations that, that are happening in architecture, we, found, we find uh, users, the clients. If we borrow terms for other disciplines, then we can find public, multitude, citizens, people, you know, this word that is constantly used, without being specific about who these guys are. What is the common identity of these a, a set of uh, persons, and what is the mat their material world, basically? What are their affections? What is the, the aesthetics that they're like implicitly cultivating? As I said before, uh, in this long period, many, many, many things happen in the office, as in normal office, very crazy things, and we were also exploring the same notions, but in fast answers to competitions, or just uh, trying to ask ourselves how we can address this kind of uh, topics or this kind of understanding of people as a context. Also in our own studios in, uh, in London, in Harvard, in Princeton, we have been working with the students trying to use this understanding to make decisions in architecture. And this one, the Gay Vatican, uh, we were just looking at the intentional communities. Um, the experiment was placed in this case in the empty 40 mile desert uh, that is a huge piece of land located all the way to Salt Lake City from the Pacific Coast. And the picture is very like clear about how arid it is. And we explore how a big public space could be an activator of an intentional community. 
in the tradition of the contest cities such as Drop City, Slab City, or the, well, this guy that is the Salvation Mountain that is also in the US. And this public space in, in this specific project is an enclave containing a series of micro buildings dedicated to all kinds of gatherings and public activities related with the community, constructed a long time with a simple technique of inflation and is a set of excessive, consciously excessive forms generated uh, inflating large silicon membranes. The shapes are, are defined uh, by limiting the movements with specific lines and points that you can see in the, in the plan. And they are stabilized with concrete, using the silicon membranes as finishing, waterproofing, and formwork. The set of um, shapes uh, that are programmatically and formally based on the exacerbation of certain peculiarities of this specific community that once played a very important role in, the, in reclaiming civil rights in America. And this is that was a fast experiment, but we truly believe that the contemporary and alternative ways of living in the world are extremely interesting. And as one of the most maybe intense and genuine products of any culture, anywhere. And for us, we understand them as a, something that constitutes at the same time a record of our societies and a critique of the society itself. And it's, uh, they are always trying to construct alternative to the codes, customs, and dominant material worlds. Based on affiliation and affection, they are always like sort of mini, mini societies proposing direct confrontation with the mainstream society. So through projects like the previous one, the, Vat the Gay Vatican, or this one, and our work at, at the Academy, as I said, during the last uh, decade, we have been speculating about how to translate into formal, material, and organizational decisions the behaviors, material worlds, symbolic expressions of these small communities without uh, translating them straightforward in a direct or maybe banal or linguistic appropriation. In this case, uh, where we took the opportunity of participating in the Greek Biennale as a pavilion for the uh, Greek Pavilion for the Venice Biennale. Um, we developed a po uh, the question was how you can think again the tears in the Mediterranean, or the mass tears in the Mediterranean. And our proposal was an alternative, uh, let's say, a space for this kind of other moments, other time, or other counter routine of our, li our own lives. And the proposal is a vast uh, silk surface that centers a, a weather, an ocean of uh, perfect weather underneath and is uh, infinite and interiorized and continuity with the surroundings, like a big communal house that centers a, a landscape confined between threads, veils and curtains and uh, manipulated by it through the proportions and the extension and the height with few constructions uh, systematically placed inside and many little pieces that are um, like a small wonders, we find them as small wonders. But the question for us was um, how the hedonistic pleasure and the holidays that are the moments of the suspen suspensions or like a moment when the time is stopped of our everyday routines, our gray lives, can be used to Make, a decision, make decisions for a project and, and to bring back the small pleasures, small pleasures in life that maybe are the biggest part. So this weird paradise uh, is not for the other part of the life, uh, as I said, the counter routine, uh, and it's a temporary compensation to the everyday life. And, well, it's exactly what is not easy to get in everyday life. That was the main idea to, for the construction of this space. So just again summarizing the, the invention of these alternative lifestyles can be considered as a conscious and political act discussing the dominant and the hegemonic, the mainstream culture through everyday practices, reinventing alternative forms of being in the world that also permit us to review the idea of shared environments. And this one, the last one, the last image now, uh, is the image for a project for the canals of Bruges in Belgium. 
and it's a big communal bed, warm and comfortable for floating in the canal of the old city center as an hedonistic oasis. So, coming back to Henry de los Rios, okay, we had a very interesting uh, problem there, right? I mean, how to deal with this group of people we introduced you. Uh, that is basically how to mm, connote, how to make connotations in architecture without direct allusion, without just linguistic reappropriation of things. Um, so how to recall those cultures without falling into simplistic, almost populistic, as I was saying before, identification to the identity of a community. Surprisingly, we found us a, 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 a possible answer in Hiner de los Rios himself. Um, his understanding of, of, uh, of landscape, uh, which is a very, a, a basically the most important contribution to modern landscaping and modern understanding of landscape coming from Spain. It's a proto-ecological one that considered the landscape as a cultural construct. He wrote not that much about it, but a really interesting, uh, interesting text that became extremely important in the, in the modern understanding of poetry, painting, and artistic uh, kind of practices in Spain afterwards. So uh, he was like approaching landscape as a cultural construct, basically, as something that has a very intrinsic and reciprocal uh, relationship and influence with culture. His approach was a mixture between a geographical understanding following Alexander von Humboldt and a pure experiential one, uh, mainly approached through excursions and walks, communal walks with his disciples and with other, with other people, you know, trying to talk about important subjects in life through the discovery, the um, somehow the the engaged discovery of the landscape around and trying to understand it, not only perceptively but also scientifically. He was obsessed with the raft beauty of the Castilian landscape, these kind of two enormous plateaus that are like in the center of the country, mainly occupying the whole surface of the entire country that through his eyes was mainly poor lands, obviously, but there were golden uh, lands of barren nature uh, and intense beauty. For Giner, for Giner de los Rios, the direct contact with things, but more specifically to landscape, was one of the most important and intense pedagogical tools to approach the, the renewal of uh, society through the education of children. So the, the contact with the landscape was irreplaceable to educate children aesthetically, but also to train them in the analysis of the world around through a direct contact with it. In fact, one of the main things he did, and this is the only photograph that we have about it, was constructing a garden in the, in the headquarters that we'll talk about it. But it was amazing that also uh, um, there, there was a record of these thoughts being translated into spaces, into even furniture for the children. Even setting up how the lights should be entering into the classrooms, how the pencils should be done, how the tables should be arranged and everything else. So there was a kind of interesting already happening, you know, translation of a, you know, this culture and material world of a, of a community throughout the practice of the construction of the environment around these, those children. So what we decided, basically, uh, was an inversion of the typical targets of architecture. So we took this idea of reconstructing the garden with no uh, written records, but just a single description, written description of someone that visited the garden once. Um, and the garden somehow uh, started to be the conceptual and material center of the whole project. So the building, as you see in the images, is just what gives shape to the garden, stepping back and becoming just a background for it. So the selected different uh, density, locations, and rhythm um, of growth was said uh, to foster somehow the, what in ecology is called the anarchic distribution of resources. So the, the different species are competing for a limited number of resources, such as water, sand, soil, and so on and so forth. So they need to compete to recreate that, what it was 
a, a really important for us that we're uh, somehow, so these are the areas, so it should be, you know, the images should be passing uh, automatically, but they're not. Um, so by setting up a series of layers in which we were accumulating inanimate uh, materials, <coughs> such as the soil, the irrigation layers, the geometrical way of arranging uh, the species, the paths, but also uh, natural species that were taken from the landscapes. He, were, he was like visiting and, and, and somehow discovering through these communal works, these excursions. In order to recreate the, the stern, um, if you want, or style beautiness of the Castilian Plateau, in which time the garden for us needed to be deciduous and the mid-side plants needed to be pruned in order to facilitate the vertical growth. So based on this, you know, almost elongating the branches, you know, in, in, in constant competition for the sun, for the sunshine. It is basically a fragment of an artificially constructed ecology. That was the main idea. So how to recreate in imperfected ways an ecology coming from those landscapes, constructing a completely artificial environment. Savage or wild because it seems to be um, barely maintained. It's not in this case really understandable, you know, uh, because the, 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 the individuals are fighting for their, you know, for the space. As the Castilian Plateau for Giner is not green, and it's there for a few weeks, but purple, coral, and silver. So they are the colors of, you know, of this environment we are used to. Um, we used, uh, as I said, the, the only system written record of the original garden to select the species contained in the, in the, in the new one, and, the, and the, that are coming from the, uh, what is called Guadarrama mountain range, that is quite a, kind of close to Madrid. And then you see in here the geometrical grid of pits in the garden with the process of plantation before setting up all the, the layers. The sequence of a wild naked garden of sprouts during the winter, slowly flowering in the spring and reaching a frugal, excessive and compacted mass of greenery, you know, that recalls the vegetable demography and dynamics of the Giner de los Rios uh, landscapes. Then it seems clear that apart from us, uh, we can somehow understand that a space is something shared, not only with other humans, but also with other species. You know, in here, they were a really important part of the construction of this group, uh, group's identity. Then apart from us, who could be, or how can we work with these other actors, these other invited uh, actors that are sharing the space with us? Then again, jumping backwards long ago, 2002, uh, that was the first period when we were starting to work thinking about an horizontal relationship between a species, animals, and people, into a, a, a relationship with other species. And this is the Magic Mountain, uh, that is an ecosystem mass for a thermal power uh, station in Ames, in Iowa. In here, what we proposed was the total transformation of the existing building into a piece of nature. And this is a video that we did for the Venice Biennale in 2000. No, that was later, 2004. Yeah, that was just a depiction of how this mm, artificial and natural environments covering an existing building could be transformed into a piece of landscape and could be uh, the place for the relationship between people and, and other actors, other uh, species. And in this one, in this other project, we, we also use the same understanding of this horizontal relationship and uh, how uh, artificially generating and converting living and uh, using living systems and architecture, you can have a, a proposal of architecture that could be mixing all these things together. And in this case, um, the difficulty of answering was based on the fact that it's a museum of energy and there's no such a collection of energy and the competition were at, uh, uh, was asking to um, re recover existing buildings and also uh, producing or doing an extension. But the, the, the topic was super difficult for us because what is in the Museum of Energy? So the decision were, were the decisions in that case were based on the management of energy to keep safe 
to the spaces from geometry, organization, and also materials, and also the, intro the introduction of a complete ecosystem within it as part of the mechanism to maximize this efficiency and this use of the, the energy. So, well, basically the air is predicted in the existing underground galleries of the old power station using the thermal inertia of the ground and, and is introducing the big inner space of the new building becoming a vast vertical action that is like the wind is going. With large indoor inverted domes that serve as a big chimneys accelerating the air. Then, inside is a complete ecosystem with natural species um, which also participate actively in the treatment of the indoor climate and the energy control. It's not only artificial. And in this way, the inner space uh, was converted into a climatic lobby and a new typology of a greenhouse. Maybe it's more obvious now for you why we were so, I thought when we were in, so interested in the term third nature, you know, something which is <coughs> somehow um, the counterpoint to first and second natures that was the term was invented in the, in the, in the early 16th century by, by Jacobo Bonfadio, a priest who was like aiming to name uh, those new things happening at that time that were the new Renaissance gardens so Renaissance gardens proposed not only a, a, a were not only were uh, artificially generated natural environments, but most importantly for us, were meant to be perceived and received as cultural uh, constructs as well. Uh, remember that most of them were somehow establishing connections along um, across time <coughs> with history, with my mythologies and, cult and classical cult culture. So that these uh, mythologies and cultures were like crucial to their own understanding, and somehow we're contesting something that for us is quite important. That is uh, the, the the usual material, geometrical, and functional understanding of architecture. So to speak, they were a, a, a necessary counterpart to discuss the the implications of architecture. In gardens, materials are alive and ever-changing, so geometry has to be happening in a different way. Uh, and they're not necessarily determined by their use, by their function, as many times in architecture. So this idea of using conceptually gardens as a place that could be counteracting architecture or conventional understanding of the construction of our environments was truly important. But also the understanding that the uh, something happening in gardens that we wanted at that time to be happening as well in architecture that was liberating itself from the narrow-minded understanding of function and the functionality of architecture as one of the main things. Of course, responding to certain um, human needs, but not only establishing a direct relationship with activities and function. So, uh, we were super interested in these big old guys in which the relationship of human activities and rituals with the space is not a close one, it's not a totally uh, fixed one, but many things in different ways can be happening, as in the case of the Cordoba Mosque that was formerly a, 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 a mosque and became, you know, this kind of weird um, um, cathedral that were, was mixing uh, a lot of things in the same place, you know, and, and provided a space for many different things uh, a long time. We were interested in those ingenious moments of typological invention somehow, in moments of crisis and change, or uh, crisis uh, and change of, of, of culture and social and political paradigms that produce this super resilient typological jumps and inventions. So we were somehow interested in that theme to recreate the headquarters of the former uh, institution, institution. So in the case of the institution, the spatial configuration uh, is based on the recreation of the historic headquarters uh, following as well the, the regulations in, in Madrid and the surrounding buildings. The proposal is very simple. It's, it's based on a series of pavilions, uh, classrooms <coughs> elevated from the from the ground, 
Like this one, this is McPherson Pavilion. It, that was an existing building, in the only remaining existing building in there that we saved and refurbished. And it, and it was the main uh, scale dimension or, the, or the scale for the inner the definition of the garden. And we were always using the, the, the definition by Gina de los Rios that is uh, the rooms should be surrounded by a belt of greenery. So always like in the perimeter. And uh, there should be an approach to the closest extent possible to the outdoor life. We are talking all the time about a very tiny building. It's very, very tiny. But anyway, still, uh, even though the scale is very tiny, still we wanted to go with that. So the final proposal was a series of pieces to be perceived as independent pavilions from the garden, but in fact, of course, necessarily connected uh, on the back, forming a super long and narrow building folded and wrapped around the wrapping garden itself. And all of them with angled and, and inclined sides, so they are perceived smaller than they are when you are inside the garden. And therefore, the institution is a system of rooms around the garden. This is like the basic uh, description of, of the project. And the geometry and the different sizes and, and groupings permit different configurations of the space. That was a, re a requirement by the client. They wanted to have very, very different, uh, many very different classrooms. And the rooms are, are, are in the design. The space has no prevalent direction. And the, the relation with the ever-changing garden is uh, all, all the time being the green belt of uh, surrounding greenery that Hiner used to explain. Uh, in a way that they are perceived as an extension of the garden and seen from the interior. And when you are in the interior, the lattice uh, disappears, really, in the pictures it's very difficult to, to show it. But when you are in the exterior, you can't see through. You can't see the interior. It's very opaque. Then, also pragmatically, the system of rooms is surrounded by a thick, speci specialized uh, dividing wall, so a thick wall, with spaces inside, like staircase, elevators, ancillary spaces, and that middle and narrow the inner public corridor that is big, is big consciously, so it's not a corridor, it's a space for working to provide informal meetings to. Uh, well, it, it's also a part of, the, of an institution of education, as you know, you have a, a school that have this kind of spaces. So just another part of the system is the underneath uh, auditorium that is using the same understanding of the classrooms, but as a continuation. So the, the auditorium is a landscape of these classrooms open that can be used for all the bigger events, biggest events in the in the foundation because it's like a, the biggest space if you wish in the building. And the, these spaces are interconnected through these big eyes, big strabismic eyes that can be closed or open depending on the amount of people inside the auditorium. So we were exploring the consequences of using exactly the same spatial arrangement in the upper part, but playing with the rooms uh, that are interconnected. Just uh, also, maybe we shouldn't elaborate too much about that, but it was important to try to also define all this or design space for this understanding of education. That was the main basic idea of the Rios. So after the competition, we also uh, at the very beginning, we initially became frustrated by the, the lack of working tools in our discipline for the further elaboration of some of these ideas we are talking about, basically the, the ones about perception. And uh, we began researching uh, the intellectual connections of these guys, of the, of the founders of the, of the institution. And suddenly, we started to discover a series of that we already know, but a series of interesting guys that were uh, experimenting with representational tools to be capable to transmit both scientific knowledge about landscapes and geography, but also the experience of visiting those spaces happening in nature. One of, uh, this is wrongly, you know, the, the caption is wrong, 
But this is uh, Baldwin's uh, account of uh, one of the first uh, balloon uh, trips or flights that he needed to make this kind of weird uh, account of someone flying for the first time, having this 360 degrees view you know, of the landscape, clouds, and sky. But more importantly, and this is part of the of the Hiner de, Lo, de los Rios legacy, because he was interested in this guy, Horace Benedict Saucer, that he was the first alpinist, I would say, not a climber, but an alpinist, so someone interested in studying the mountain range of Alps and trying to describe it. So he was putting money uh, to, to give a, a somehow a, a prize for the first one, you know, climbing the Mont Blanc. You know, because he was interested not in climbing, but in this, you know, discovering the view from it. To be, for the first time, describing the peaks and the mountain range and the geographical formations around it. Because it was the only way. So he initiated a series of excursions, as you know, the Rios did, trying to describe that experience. You know? He's not by himself. <coughs> He's, um, he, he was a commission to a, a drawer that he uh, gave money to be climbing to the glacier of wood, to be describing for the first time, you know, the surrounding landscape and the surrounding mountain formations. <coughs> and this other guy, who was also uh, extremely important for the Hiner de Lorio's understanding of landscape and, and geography, uh, who's like a French geographer and a painter, and also watercolorist, that um, there was somehow inventing a really magical somehow device that was capable to translate the movement of your eyes looking at mountains and geography into drawings. These are the outputs. So he invented a tool called, called the orograph that with a small telescope, very simple one, attached to a pencil that was like drawing the movement of your eyes, follow, so the movement of the telescope, uh, so following your eyes, you know, across the landscape, describing the lines of the mountains and the, and the position of the peaks in several points across the landscape. So he was able to draw the most exact maps of the Pyrenees mountain range between Spain and France. So this uh, the, the 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 first working drawings, you know, he was redrawing afterwards. We think, you know, on on the on his workshop. So <coughs> almost a magical thing, right? How to translate the movements of the eye into into drawings, right? <coughs> but we found similar representation on, and also I would say geographical confidence in the work of Alexander von Humboldt whose work has been, was translated by Giner de los Rios' brother, into Spanish, by Giner de los Rios' brother, uh, Bernardo. In his case, it's in the act of drawing and noting where the discovery takes place. It's not before, so he was like, yeah, gathering data and gathering, you know, measurements of, of the luminosity of the sky, of the humidity, of the placement of different species and so on, to be capable and this is the first time that this happened, to be <coughs> describing the allocation of different species in relation with humidity, height, and exposure to sunshine, you know, in this case. So it's the first proto-ecological description of the world. And it was in this drawing where the discovery happened, not before. So this idea of representational tools that somehow are also asking for, as you see here, you know, a validity. So this, this, uh, as real entities, you know, as small worlds, as cosmologies that are not only representing the world but reclaiming the right of being considered, you know, alternatives to it as well. So we were interested in how this could be somehow translated into architecture, constructing this, um, these small microcosms that were like an account of the connections of a specific group of people and other species within a, you know, substantially reduced space, within a single, you know, inclusive space. So, as I said, we are talking only about one project, but we are talking about many of other projects that we have been doing. 
in the office. This one is still alive, so we, who, who knows when it's going to be finished, but hopefully soon. And we won the competition in 2008, so it's just 10 years, it's not that much. So it's a, a palace for the cherry blossom uh, tree in the Gerte Valley, and it was thought to, to be one uh, tourist, um, touristic attraction in the, in the valley. And we propose a building that is uh, assertive with the I mean, the appearance is like a consciously like a, a, against the landscape, like being something especially like visible. And the size and the scale uh, establishes a connection with the valley. The valley is huge, and the building is 1,000 square meters, so it's like nothing. It's a paper. So we inverted. In this case, we inverted the idea of Giner de los Rios. Giner de los Rios is about doing a garden and, and constructing an, an inner garden and a nature. This is the other way around. It's like an inverted space that is uh, connected with the landscape, choosing the ways of connecting it. And it's a space for, uh, it's a choreographed space that is a space for doing things like a rave in Ibiza or in Ibiza or a, or going to a cathedral or to a church. So it's this kind of optic spaces, or that was the, the wish. So at the same time, this uh, interior space is defined by big holes that, as I said, are connected with the studio in selected ways, like entrances, views, some light connections. So what we proposed uh, in this case was a kind of a contemporary chapel we always describe this as a contemporary chapel because this building is going to be like open for a few days a year, so for the for the cherry blossom uh, festival, maybe for the other things, but only a few days and kept closed during the whole year. So really like a chapter in the middle of the landscape. Then the entire building is organized uh, as this final destination of the pilgrimage of tourism, like um, the end of this long. Yeah, tree there, and it is well as you can see. It's a concrete ring, and th there are several rooms underneath. This was under construction. The ramp is huge; it's big. Also, to be a uh, one room, a external room, like a space in itself, is out of scale. To be in a space, this is the foyer in the ground floor, and those are the underneath rooms the construction. So mm, the concrete ring is surrounded by a non-structural lower part, metallic part, and an upper uh, steel shale-like structure functioning as a dome, mm -hmm. as you will see now. We introduced, as Christina was describing, these big openings that connect the totally interiorized optic space, which is only connected in few points with exterior selective waves. To be this this kind of point, connection points uh, of the inner space with the landscape, distorting obviously the shell behavior. You know, you know when, when you're opening up um, holes or, or open with these big eyes to, towards the landscape in places that they are not supposed to be. So you're like uh, literally distorting, you know, the shell behavior thing. So what we did was bending back the holes towards the interior, so they were capable to modulate the light coming in, but also reintroducing a stiffness in, within the rings, so they were re-stabilizing the structural behavior of the dome at the same time, transforming the tessellation that you saw in the models of the surface, you, you know, both things at the same time. To construct this space defined as a big room, uh, surrounded by a three-dimensional structure of interwoven steel plates, quite simple, simply simply done, to ensure similar behavior to that of a dome, you know, that is replicated towards the interior with a mosaic of rhomboid figures that serve to fine-tune also the acoustic of the whole, so you can imagine what is happening when there's such a big space that is becoming uh, too resonant, as you see in the symmetries of the upper steel structure and the under construction. So, well, we are like, a, this is kind of war in Spain, the crisis started in 2008 and it's still very hard, so we are still waiting for the budget to come back and finish the building, maybe as this one, maybe not, let's see what happens. 
But we also firmly believe that there is a certain specificity related with architecture given by its materiality and equilibrium that can be explored playfully. We always like uh, have this kind of double way of thinking that is very pragmatic on the one hand and very playful on the other one. So we we think that the dome can be infralight, why not? And a mason view structure can be literally inverted in its mechanical behavior, why not? So developed for the ESA school in Paris, this pavilion is an infralight uh, dome. Uh, it's uh, just uh, can be reused and, or, and kept in a box where, where it is not inflated and uh, can be inflated in accordance with the event, events, uh, public events. It's golden externally and white internally and it can be kept connected with the courtyard, I mean just uh, anchored to the courtyard uh, wall. We did one small scale version of it in, in the Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo, one to five. And we developed this project following the behavior of masonry structure, strictly. And well, this is the model following the theories of Robert Hooke to show the problems of St. Peter's dome. And in this case, what we did with the dome is say playing with physical behavior in the digital realm to simulate the process of inflation and therefore the actual shape of the final piece, digitally reproducing somehow the physical automata by Antonio Gaudi and also the so-called soft concrete by the Spanish architect Miguel Fisac. He was exploring the behavior of concrete long, long ago. It was very important for our, maybe more local tradition, but it's still very important for us. So some, somehow the, the dome is a real inverted catenary that we well, de developed through a series of iterations. It was clearly funny to do iterations. And the position of the binding uh, points and seams, very similar to the gay Vatican that we saw before, um, define the shape. And therefore, the volume of air containing each point, changing the, the gas or air and cut in the case of the mock up, so that the formation of the membrane were based on that uh, geometry to finally produce this kind of infralight uh, dome or pavilion. And in the case of Ginar de los Rios, it's kind of similar. It's playing with what we perceive, or how we perceive the structures functioning and the real functioning of the structure. So the difference between these two things, and how deceptive on one hand, and how complex this perception of uh, materiality of things can be. Right? So because of the, of the dividing walls around the garden, we could have a lot of um, somehow a stiffness against horizontal forces with these walls and then the columns of the building could be these, these are the, the bigger ones <laughs> could be really these thin elements of steel plates that are holding the entire thing you see in here in the structure obviously but whenever you visit the building you see nothing and the building seems to be uh, held or held by the volume of, of air contained within between the lattice and the glass. Because what you perceive is just a series of st steel plates that look like uh, the substructure, something similar to this, the substructure of that is holding the, the glass in place. So <clears throat> basically the lattice it acts as a filter between the classrooms and the, gar as the, and the garden, as a light, light veil, but also uh, was based on, was an, a small experiment based on someone that we really love. If you don't know him, go to Google, type Ramon Ancajal, Ramon, Santiago Ramon y Ancajal, the name is really in English, so, and look for his drawings. He's a, a proto, the first, I would say, is the father of modern neurobiology. And he made this wonderful, but this is only one. This, there are thousands of them of the neurons of the brain, describing basically the bas basic functioning of the brain itself, looking at it and drawing it. Was a Nobel pl Prize uh, this time, but he was investing for several years, a lot of time on something that was like investigating the, the chiasma, this part of the brain where the optical nerves are crossing, that supposedly is the moment when we construct our vision as humans. So he was like investing a bit of time of getting to know how the 
uh, nerves coming from the eyes were intersecting and how the information was traveling across the nerves. Understanding how this process that is called stereopsis, which is how we perceive death, you know, in everyday basis, how this information is coming from the two eyes is crisscrossed to construct, you know, you know, our perception of death that doesn't exist in real world. I'm sorry. So this is basically what happens, you know, is also this kind of funny game that many of us did when we were children, right? That is looking at something, you know, with uh, closing one eye and looking to uh, iteratively uh, do the same thing with one eye closed and then the other one. So it's moving and if the thing is small enough, it is disappearing. Because it's placed out of something that <coughs> Uh, neurobiologists know very well that is the panel area is where the things that we perceive as single objects that are perceived as the same image for the book for both eyes are placed so things that are out of this area that are perceived differently from our eyes by our eyes and our brain is literally getting rid of certain information so this is called optical confusion. It's how our perception of death is constructed. So basically, in the picture, sorry, you have to visit the building. So you're very welcome to come to Madrid. Wonderful time. weather in there, 21 degrees nowadays, today. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful food and wine. But if you visit the building, the lattice is literally disappearing. Because the difference of brightness from the interior, the difference of brightness of the garden makes your I being focused on the greenery, and greenery out there, and then the bars of the lattice that are small enough, they are out of the pounds area, and they tend to be disappearing. So the effect, literally, is like looking through a window in a rainy day. We wanted to reproduce this effect of concentration and enclosure, you know, being indoors. You know, this wonderful feeling of looking through the window when there is rain outside, and you see the, the exterior, but there is a blurry presence of the drops of, of rain that is making you somehow be more enclosed and more concentrated. So it's similar to the light thing, basically, yeah. around yourself. <clears throat> so, so to speak, the background takes optical presence over the lattice, and then the lattice tends to disappear. It is uh, basically made out of three uh, tiny steel bars, uh, similar to those that are like used on, on, sorry, on retaining walls for 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 foundations. You know, this this but without corrugation is the same process. They so the people that did it were the same ones, as cheap as a foundation reinforcement can be. So we simply <coughs> soaked them into a galvanic uh, bath afterwards and that's that's the thing whose density is uh, is is uh, is set up according to the sunlight exposure and uh, and the, the views that are created from the inside to the inside to, 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 to the garden and from the garden to the inside in certain points we wanted to uh, view a bit more from from the garden and uh, there are no friends so that was basically to be having this lattice that is perceptibly disappearing. So the thin bars of the first two layers are crossing one another and, and weld, and they're weld, to, provo to provide rigidity to the whole panel. This is the, the three layers and the three overlaps of a typical one. And, uh, and they're like uh, together, um, or they're working together with these spacers, you know, they're like horizontally being placed uh, along the panel. So that is the only thing that you perceive whenever you're in the interior. <coughs> so in here you see, you know, basically the thing and the construction, and they just the, the corners that the bars are coming to the interior and welded, so so you're not perceiving any any kind of um, strong edge, but you're having this clean definition of the volumes that are happening across the entire building. The effect of transparency is inverted, you know, and this we know that perfectly during the night light, the night time, whenever the lights are on. 
And obviously this becomes a background to the garden itself that is reflecting a certain point we wanted to introduce color into the lattice, but we thought it's better the lattice to be reflecting the colors of the garden. So again, this back and forth between Pinar de los Rios Foundation and our life in the office doing other projects, in, in this one we were also working uh, with vision as a possible definition of the, the geometry, the spaces and, and the kind of a space of uh, architecture. This is uh, the archaeological visitor center in Cunha Sulpicia in, in Burgos, Peñalba de Castro. And it's the entrance to the, an archaeological site, huge one. So it's a tiny building to be like the way of entering. And we played with the possibility of giving shape to the things through our eyes in the same way that we did it with Gina de los Rios. We will explain this later and the surroundings and the surroundings with the landscape. And the building is just a thick horizontal slab elevated from, uh, elevated from the ground to cover a set of parallel rooms and uh, an, an horizontal landscape constructed by parallel beams that permit uh, this panoramic view of the interior and as well of the surroundings. Uh, and the emptying of a large axis constructs the projection of the view to the landscape. And crosses the rooms perpendicular from side to side as a visual cone by means of another transverse reinforced reinforce beam that in fact is necessary to, to hold all these perpendicular beams. And it becomes an outdoor space oriented towards the Celtiberian settlement, original city. On top of the slab, a landscape proof is simply an extension of the surrounding landscape. And the slab is defined by a set of bolted reinforced concrete shell beams with variable widths that go down to the edge of the windows, like in there, and also like... A bit more. Yeah. Like more this like, more. Yeah. And, and the bolts are punctuated by skylights that intersect in parallel to the flat sides of the shells. And, well, that is the old problem of having a, the, a very big space and not having light directly, the inner part is very dark, so that's why, why we introduced this, this light. And it's, uh, from outside it's almost imperceptible from, from the road. By reducing the, this height to three meters, it becomes an abstract line on the hillside of So the idea, this idea of giving shape to the space based on the site of movement, <coughs> It comes again uh, to the institution Libre de Enseñanza, to the free institution. So uh, the position and size of the rooms were defined by our eyes in movement. So making the main walk, you know, towards the garden. So we started to uh, give shape to the building in accordance to the cones, the visual cones at every height. This is the basic drawing that we did for the competition. We re-elaborated a bit afterwards, but it was the basic first drawing that we did. So following a path, as in the gardens by William Kent, so to construct the experience, we were giving shape to the surrounding volume. So the diagonals could be made. And if we consider our eyes, the basic idea was if we consider our eyes instead of <coughs> screens that receive information, you know, as in the case of Santiago La Monica Hall, as projectors that are capable to shape things around you. That's the main notion for setting up this set of pavilions that are perceptibly independent, but nevertheless a single building. So we are giving so we are able to give shape to the diagonals, looking for the bigger distances, so you're perceiving the space as bigger than it is. You are like uh, placing certain things in certain positions to really choreograph the creation of the garden, the inner garden itself. Almost finishing now. Uh, we are going to enter in the building. It's much better if you come to Madrid, I agree. Good food, good wine, good weather. <laughs> come, call us, we can invite you to a beer. So, but anyway, it's not the same. It's really not the same because it's very difficult to catch in the images, the description that the friend did about the perception. But anyway, let's enter. Let's enter through the narrow, very narrow space and to discover the, the S path that was uh, in the drawings. 
and then to start discovering these fragmented uh, pieces of building, pavilions, classrooms. Nowadays, it's even more difficult to see them because the, the garden is like a very, very wild. It's growing like crazy. This is a, the young, young uh, garden, like two or three years ago. One and a half years. It's only like, yeah, but if you go, you can see what I mean with, uh, it's wild, it's really wild. But at the end, this is the real part of the, of the building is where the auditorium is excavated. That's why the, the garden is just vertical. In, not, not seen in that picture. The entrance to the auditorium, and then the upper part. And you can see that there are many uh, inclined uh, parts that was also trying to, to make them disappear and, and make them smaller perceptively, I mean the scale. And if we go again well, to the entrance, uh, from the outside, it's very, very difficult to see the, the, the you go, it's like only fragments. It's, uh, only from the street, you can see that tall piece. The, the building itself, and that was a conscious decision, refuses to be seen. It's not, as I said when we were starting the lecture, we don't want to produce buildings, objects, and put them on top of the floor. We consciously wanted to, to the building to refuse to be seen, to be understood as a building. And, well, in, in, this is in the same way that Esquina uh, de los Rios refused all his life to be taken in a picture. The building is like following his will, so difficult to, to show. So by spending time with these descriptions of the world that you saw, as rather Humboldt and uh, Saucer, so our own kind of work as well, um, we understood that our sessions in the multi-layered readings of architecture, something that we tried today with a single building to explain, and with the project of architecture understood as a form of knowledge, we discovered all these things, every single one throughout the project. Was, weren't coming to us like magically, were like a, through the understanding of of the world of connections of this guy, Henry de Locrios, how we entered into this realm of vision, uh, construction of, 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 of gardens and ecologies. We understood that, in fact, we were trying to define a small scale alternative worlds, microcosms, if you want. Uh, somehow self-contained small walls that could reflect a particular understanding of the world. That was the attempt of, of this building and, and the experiments, experiments we were doing meanwhile. Trying to reflect and establish effective relations with objects, with subjects, with other species as well, by embodying them in either physically or virtually. And uh, in doing so, these materialized microcosmoses could provide a mm, small scale alternative to the social and spatial usual conventional orders in the same way that the gardens and pavilions of the original institution were during 80 years until the arrival of the Spanish war, civil war. Proposing, in other words, alternative notions of beauty, those coming from specific cultures, groups, and identities, based on a direct and deep appreciation and understanding of the world around, selectively reconstructing and reenacting our bones with it, with the world around, constructing the experience, as William Kent said, with intellectual ambition and festival commitment. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much. A two-part question. Um, first one is a very practical part. Is there a gardener, or someone especially takes care of the garden, or is the, the kind of responsibility of the people using it otherwise? Second part: Is it intentional that you didn't show any people in the building? Because uh, probably after construction images. Uh, 
I'm not even asking if there will be people. I'm just maybe curious to know if the people using the building spend most of their time in the garden or looking at the garden in their kind of breakout spaces in the corridor. First of all, there is not only a garden, but it was only a landscape. And as a how designer in the world with us, we, we didn't mention that. That was fundamental to this understanding because it, it is, uh, she is Teresa from Barcelona, and in fact, it was a discovery that uh, she was our friend for, for many years. We were teaching together many times, and at certain point, we discovered that herself was the um, grand um, sister of someone similar to you know, the Lorio's father in Barcelona. So it was like, wow, we we're having here a connection. So, yeah, uh, there is a gardener who has the order of not or selectively pruning feral things, only. On the other side, like growing. So Teresa and ourselves defined a systematic way of, um, of uh, somehow maintaining it out in our time that consists on the plants that are dying, are dying. The plants that are growing will survive. So that's the thing. So we'll. So we didn't explain that much, but uh, the, the garden is created by different layers and putting in water, and putting in species depending on the sunlight, and, 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 and really leaving them widely grown. That's, that's the thing, basically. So we did something that in nature is quite common as well, because that's why pruning is coming. That is the, the non, not very natural thing that is happening whenever the, a, a, the, the trunk falls down. So the, the what's called in English epicomic um, uh, sh uh, uh, shoots are coming out, and there are these super elongated branches that are growing coming from the main trunk. You have been seeing this billions of times, right? Next time that you see a lot of branches coming out of the old trunk, that is uh, what is called epicomic shoots in, in, in gardening. And that's the only thing that we, we, we did for it. So we cut the, the there were like 13 bushes that were like substantially deep when they came. We cut them and then they started to grow wildly towards the, towards the sky. Uh, there is a particular reason for the pictures. So these pictures are only uh, main, uh, mainly, most of them are like uh, only when we, um, when, the, when the building was uh, started to be used basically done by a photographer. I think there are only three or four that are done by us last autumn, the, the, the ones that I shown were in, in growth. And we're waiting for certain things to happen to make this, the, the, this more alive. Uh, photographs of the entire theme performing in the way we are describing. So in fact, there is a publication coming very soon each that will be reflecting all these things. So far, we don't have that yet. So we want, uh, we want the garden to be uh, slightly older than you know, this, this thing that we wanted to have at the very beginning. Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, as you've been describing or discussing a lot about the uh, context, um, I'm wondering uh, what is the, the architectural discourse context that you're settling yourself in? Because often you describe uh, words as uh, after pop or post digital, etc. Just describe your work then what what does those terms mean in in terms of um, building or constructing or a physical space? The um well, the lecture is also quite centered in that building that obviously deals with history. Because the, the main subject was like a, a history of this um, community at the end of the day that were trying to reconstruct their own past. Right? So basically that's why all these references to the past and all these geographers and people interested in landscape, in the beginnings of modern landscape and geography, yeah, are in here. Right? So in our case, particularly in, in the realms of the work, are very much interested in transmission of knowledge nowadays. That's why we are referring to this project digital, which is not meant to be uh, an interest on representational things, 
is the, or, uh, many of or the people of our generation is in, but basically trying to think how uh, our users, these devices we're having around, including this one or the ones that you're having in the pocket, is affecting nowadays the way culture is being transmitted. So that's uh, our current interest, and that's why we are defining ourselves in this way. Uh, but uh, doing it not to, I mean, not through uh, somehow having a heavy interest in technology itself, but understanding how we construct nowadays and disseminate cultural artifacts around us, how we are like getting information and knowledge and well, knowledge not that much, but information through these devices and the way we are immersed in a meaningless ocean of information, I would say. That's our realm, and that's where we are working now, both in our studios and in our practice. How to, literally, I mean, we are obsessed, so I think we are constantly describing, is that nowadays when we're having a group of students and we are showing them a, a, a absolutely beloved piece coming from history, Everyone nowadays says to, to you, I, I know this. I have this. I've se I've seen this before. Almost no one knows who is the author, the date, or where it's coming from. The information. So that, for us particularly, subjects, is something that obsesses us nowadays a lot. It's the world of ten years almost. You know, how these devices are currently affecting the way we put information together and we produce buildings, furniture, cultural artifacts, books, websites. That's something that for us is quite important. Right? And that, that <coughs> in our case, is our context. Mm? Because also we have been like a very much greater with academia last, in the last uh, past years. And, and this is something that we have been seeing our students being affected by dramatically, drastically, I would say. Not dramatically, it sounds like uh, apocalyptic, I'm going to say that. <laughs> They're like super positive side streets. <laughs> but drastically, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, so, you said that um, for you as architects, uh, one of the most important focuses is on the human and on constructing the human experience, right? So I'm curious, uh, when the buildings get actually built and people start using them, how much emphasis do you put on, on analyzing and studying how the real people are actually using the building? And how much do they fulfill your predictions of uh, how they would like the building and so on? Mm. Oh, well, we are like going almost every day to Genial de los Rios Foundation still. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so and, and we are we are learning and, and discovering not just also I mean not only as something that we want to do as for the office like a, an understanding of the building not that kind of understanding more like to just discover things throughout these years. Because even the garden, for us, has been a, such an amazing surprise because it, it has been growing so fast. And all the species, he was explaining that some species have been disappearing or they are like uh, taking over the place because they are very strong. So many things are for us like a discovery. And this is the, an, an amazing thing. If you if you construct the building and you, it's finished and you just forget about it and you don't come back, that many of our professors used to say this to us. Don't come back. It's a pity. It's a pity. I mean, if a building is a back. if if a building is a dead body that is like once it's open and you have finished, it's okay. For us, it's not the understanding of architecture. So that's very important. More, more than practical. I mean, we are learning a lot about that. And also we enjoy a lot when, when we go like uh, to visit because the floor is having problems and you have to go every day to sort things out. Many people that is not an architect or related with the discipline, when they enter, they really like it. It's, and for us, it's well, super rewarding because it's not like all of us saying architecture is this and that, but people enjoying it that most. Yeah, we, we haven't done this formally for academic, right? So we haven't done this, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
but something that Christina was describing is <coughs> and the experience of many people because they're attracted, so they see something. Because from the street is not that visible. They see something. They enter into the car. They discover this wall. They don't understand anything. Many, many of them. So at the practical level of somehow uh, someone walking on the sidewalk, you know, and entering, they they see the guard and they go, oh, this very strange thing happening here, things growing wildly, this is strange building that I don't understand. Why is this covered with uh, these metal bars? And entering within the building for the exhibition somehow, discovering this world. This is something, and people going there in everyday basis to make use of the, the spaces just for, for, for the pressure. And there's the other one that is actually very rewarding. Uh, because when we started this project, uh, we got a, a, a question in the power to the government that was in power in that time regarding the building and regarding the place. Because we were supposedly destroying the, the thing. So it was a, 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 a formal question in the, in the Spanish government at that time, asking about us and the things that we were doing there. As almost criminals, right? No, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, they were in their own right of asking, and, and because there, there was a kind of undergoing secret about what, what the what the thing was, um, well, how the things were going in the place, right? <coughs> so they, there was a lot of people against the project, uh, literally. So we're like uh, we were developing. There was a moment where nothing could be coming out both of our office and on the construction side because there was the danger of, us, of everything being stopped. So we were like keeping everything in secret and in fact we couldn't show anything to anyone. There was only a leak and it was a, a disaster that provoked the, the parliament, the question in the parliament. And then when it was open, it seems that not everybody because obviously there is not a, a total consensus about it. But most importantly, the descendants are being rejected. There's something that we're like giving to our as a people. So they're like, a, yeah, they understood that there was no way of reconstructing the thing that maybe it was. And it was a necessary, somehow, modern, I would say modern or actualized, is better than actualized. Contemporary take on you know, the religious thought. And it was the, the thing. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not our, our it works, it's their words. You know, that they feel reflected in, in this strange garden, and this strange world of things. Great, thanks. <laughs> and maybe a follow up question taking this uh, post. Well, taking this analysis of uh, already built building uh, one step further, uh, not necessarily this particular building, but in general, when we discover that people are not liking some parts of it, or, or over the years, the preferences of people change inevitably, how much should we be ready to rebuild some parts of the building, and how much should we already in the beginning, design for the building to be adjustable and adaptable in the long term? Well, we were somehow following the suggestions of our clients regarding the adaptability of the building. So, um, in fact, there is no... Sorry. Uh, there is no uh, functioning, function, uh, functional determination of any space. So, we were actually uh, uh, raising... Because in the, in the program they gave us for the competition, there was like a name, some things, and we decided to somehow delete any kind of functional determination of the spaces. So literally to have a, a complete range of things happening in there. That's the first, that's the first thing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would say that for us, a way of responding to your, the first part of your question, that is how a changing culture could be accepting a building which is related with a specific moment or a specific reading of someone that was living back in the late uh, 19th century. 
And the only way, uh, apart from the sewing and reconstructing, which we are like in favor of, so not, not because we want things to be destroyed and reconstructed, because there is a culture of, of doing things that is changing. Right? The only way of responding to this question intellectually is embedding in the project, in the building, as many layers of possible readings, uh, the, or the biggest number of possible readings. This is what we call multiple uh, levels of meaning or reading. So in practical terms means that someone that is not knowing anything about Giner de los Rios, nothing about the history of there, it just pop up and, pan and jump into the, the space and uh, I like it or I dislike it, whatever, right? But uh, it's engaging with the space itself, which is the most important thing for us. And secondly, someone that is really into, into that history of Spanish culture, right, is literally uh, interested in how, for example, that is related with Ramon in half, Cajal theories of vision. So this kind of different levels of reading which could be affecting the kind of everyday experience of a space, but at the same time, why an intellectual as well take on, on certain parts of the thing. Yeah, and fortunately the building cannot be destroyed you know, partially. Or can be, yeah, would be a nice project to be done, <laughs> destroying it partially, but it was not meant to be uh, able, it's, it's to funny, use. maybe this is second that is not part of the lecture, but it's funny, but uh, Sir Norman Foster is now living between London and Madrid, because he's married uh, with a, she's married with a Spanish uh, doctor. And uh, he has a foundation in Madrid. He has his own foundation. And he's using our building for the events, because he likes much more our building than his foundation. So it's, this is... Not my interest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for Norman Foster, like, okay, this is. It's a good compliment. <laughs> so it's, it's working very nicely. We are very happy with life that is coming. But well, everyone gets old, so he will be old. He or she. He's a he or she. He's a she. Thanks. I'm actually really loud, so I don't. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. I guess my question is short. I haven't figured out how to phrase it, but I'll give it a go. Um, obviously, the structure, the physicality of the building is you know, somehow mediating the individual's experience of how they sensorily perceive the environment the position is in. But have you guys considered about like how does the physicality of the building kind of inform or mediate in some way the relationship amongst the individuals who are currently using the building. What does that concern you at all? The building of a community or how the occupants of the building can interact with each other because of the certain functionality or the arrangement of the building. Have you looked into that or does it concern you in any way? Um, yes, and, and there is always uh, so mean from this side, it might, be, it might sound uh, easy to say many of the things that we have been expressing today, but it took us a lot, a lot of time to, to somehow structure and formulate this this discourse that we're having nowadays, right? Meaning that we are having a concern, a concern about how the arrangement of spaces, both physically and organizationally, is affecting people's behavior. So in fact, in the schools, one of the things that we no, no, it is, to be totally honest, but several years ago we uh, made our students to, to be stu to study, literally, it was a, a both the physicality of the space and behavior of the space. So one of our students developed a, an app that is tracking people, and tracking people's movements, and tracking people's behavior, but it's mostly about how you could examine and study this relation between human behavior configuration of space. We don't have an answer. So to, I mean, to be clear, honest, and, and direct, we don't have an answer to that. We are pretty interested in, in resilient, uh, um, very stable organizations, special organizations that are capable to accommodate, because of their complexity of relations among different spaces, to accommodate different uses. Because we do believe that there is a, a certain, and that's a belief, I have to say, not absolutely 
uh, proved that there is a, a relation between freedom of behavior and complexity, no complexity, visual complexity, eh? complexity of a space in terms of complex organizations. So, so we are amazed, let me put a, an example of that. So one of the spaces we really love is the Cordoba Mosque in, in, in Cordoba, in Spain. It's, it's something in a space that we have the experience to, to, to be related with when we were children. So in fact, we were playing in their football. So in a, a formal cathedral. And so it was our playground somehow. <coughs> and it was like, uh, even though it was like really um, bespoke to be serving a ritual, which is praying, you know, a, a very specific way of praying, one specific with direction, was suitable to accommodate many different things in our history. Because it is super resilient, but it's, I would say, quite an amazing complex organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some, somehow it did. Um, and uh, I, I guess I don't want to beat around the bush. Um, yeah. I, I, I have a follow up to that. And uh, do you feel like, as architects, um, do you feel you're somehow ethically responsible for part of the experience of the occupant who are using it? Or because you're, you're setting the tone for that kind of a, a, a physical or or a, a sensory kind of a, a discourse, mm -hmm. do you feel ethically kind of somehow burdened by that kind of a, you know, for, for well, doing that? There is, a, you know, it, there is a something intrinsic in, in, in the practice of architecture that you somehow are constantly um, enforcing you know, certain behaviors. So it's, it's I have to say it. You have, um, you're like walking other possibilities. You have uh, this kind of a strange relationship with enforcement and freedom in the buildings or the space or yeah, the environments you are like. You're facilitating and you're like uh, neglecting other things. And obviously, uh, if we were not trying to be, I don't know if we are like already, you know, we are actually. Um, I guess we were practicing in completely different ways and having a better business, <laughs> a based office, I would say. Um, I don't know if we are successful or not, to be totally clear and honest as well, but at least we are trying. Yeah, thank you. Oh, one, la <laughs> yeah, yeah, one, one last quick thing. Please. Uh, it appears, I'm, I'm just assuming you guys are working in, in team. Uh, any you know, really quick tip on how architect can kind of, work, or I don't know, people with creativity or people who work on creative projects, you know, work together like personal experience wise. And well, I mean, basically, a, most of the things that are happening around us are collective works. So, in the sense, architecture is one of them only. But uh, you cannot do architecture by yourself. So, you know, it would be uh, well, something weird. But you can only practice architecture if you're dealing with people, other, other people, but other teams, other teams, bigger teams. If you are related with these uh, collectives around, uh, whenever you. So, architecture by itself is a collective task that somehow some are carrying on their shoulder the responsibility of making certain decisions. This is for us the role of, of architects. But to think that we practice in isolation on to respect to the world around is a very common mistake, but it's for us is not even a fit. So that's why we try to look at these things we, we try to explain today. Because we do think that there is a way of breaking the wall and stopping projecting your subjective stakes on the wall into others' behaviors and others' cultures. Does it make sense? This thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thank you for the lecture. Um, I would like to ask you to talk a little bit about like the ecosystems in the garden and also how you consider the other there, and then later talk about kind of the way these machines also change our perception of things and also how we start to produce things. Would you ever consider this other type of vision or this other type of other in, uh, in your work? And also maybe how you make the buildings? Yes. The one part of, so, yeah, yeah. The, the, there is part of our world that I've been related with that. I uh, have to say that lately uh, we have been very much related with these, those preoccupations within the academia or within the academic world with our students particularly. And yes, but uh, uh, there is a, um, I have to say that there is an intrinsic difficulty in working uh, with this kind of methodologies we're trying to set up, which is time. And uh, there is a willingness or a desire of doing certain things, but sometimes we're not capable to have time enough to do certain things. Yeah, there is a line on our future kind of line of development that is very much ready with that. But not intrinsically about exploiting the possibilities of these uh, entities, right, that you referred to, but most importantly, the affection of the digital world in the way, the way we tried to explain it before, in the way we perceive things and we, we, we are dealing with other people. We are totally amazed uh, by our students uh, somehow filtering within our classroom and sending one another, without talking one another, sending constantly uh, text messages, you know? And we are amazed, I mean, we're like, on an everyday basis, we are like uh, absolutely, uh, unbelievably seeing these things around us and people uh, doing multiple search in different engines while we're talking about something. So they can reply on, on, on real time to our assertions. Saying, this was said by someone before, right? And this thing that you're referring to, and this, I mean, this is absolutely uh, changing the way we, we might be in the future uh, related with the construction of things in mainly with cultural artifacts. So yeah, th that's our main interest now. Mm -hmm. So it, you would more use it kind of as a phenomenon, but not incorporate it into your practice in terms of um, like visually maybe, and also how you construct the buildings. In the case of Hino de Loria's foundation, there was something, that, let me refer you with an example, something really beautiful that happened at a certain, certain point in the construction, of the physical construction of the building, right? So we were defining all these lattice, so there were like, there were like 1,000 different panels, one, all the feet. So the only way of doing them was like throughout the scripting. We were like scripting the thing, taking up on the things, and all, and setting up things. So they were like randomly adjusting one another. So you were capable to see the scenes between the part, all these kind of things, right? And in house problems that are not that interesting for people that is not into it. And uh, so at certain point, we realized that we needed to redo everything by hand. Because there were certain effects that were like supposedly. Uh, created that were not happening. So we need them, we, we uh, needed to redo everything by hand means mm, uh, not digitally, but you know, moving things around, you know, the computer and they're doing this kind of, yeah, all uh, kind of old school um, kind of things. The funny thing is that <coughs> uh, also the, an affection of this thing, of this kind of a strange uh, world between the virtual and the physical, that it was only possible to, to, to construct it because there was a, a company that took our files, digital files, put them in a machine, uh, cut everything digitally, and then they went to their workshop and in a most manual way, I would say, assemble everything. So this kind of weird combination between, you know, machines, scripts running, us moving bars, you know, one millimeter because the effect was not created, and then 
these guys with their machines, uh, laser cutting with lasers and setting up everything, and then them as well, you know, welding everything by hand. You know, this kind of a strange <coughs> combination uh, of different <coughs> things happening that are happening constantly around us is what what is our main world of interest. And it's not purely machines or the digital world or the virtual. It's kind of this. A strange world of connections between digital and virtual entities and ourselves and the physicality of our bodies. All these strange things that are happening around us lately. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>